Dean John Elliott, would you get the ball rolling with us? It would be my pleasure, Bob. Good morning, everyone. It's really uh, my pleasure to be with you. This is the 10th conference that I've had the pleasure of greeting and welcoming. Uh, and I think that you all are a testimonial to the relationship that we over time have been able to build with the professional community. And I'm struck by a couple of things about this morning. Uh, one is that Bob shared with me just before uh, I came up here that uh, in the audience today, over the course of the day, and as many of you know, the room will grow as the day goes forward. Uh, in the audience today, we will have, my notes tell me, some 29 faculty members representing 25 different schools. And I think it's a real testimonial to the fact that we are, first and foremost, an academic institution. And what we care about is being sure that uh, we're part of the dialogue, we're part of the policy making, policy discussing, and so forth, as we will be this morning, but also that our faculty involve themselves in these activities in such a way that what they do in the classroom is on the cutting edge of what you all are doing in the world. And I must say that um, the last five years have been an exciting time to try to stay up with you. Uh, it's been a very busy, dynamic, evolving period of time. So I'm pleased that Bob has been able to, year after year after year, design a topic that seems, as it was designed in February of last year, uh, to be very forward-looking because it turns out to be very timely uh, when the time actually comes for you all to come together. I am the dean of the Zicklin School of Business. We are at Baruch College. And it would be uh, unseemly for me not to just share with you a couple of things about this institution. Uh, sometimes I've gone back to 1847 we were, when we were founded on the corner of 23rd and Lexington Avenue. Today what I'd like to do is just give you a very quick snapshot of three or four events of the last four months. One event is the fact that we are currently 18,300 students. Uh, this is a very large number. It's larger than we expected. And it's a testimonial to the fact that our students, coming from New York for the most part, very much want education. And many of you may have been seeing in the popular press these debates about whether or not education was still cost justified, whether or not students were getting their value from their education. And the negative language would go, uh, nobody can find a job. The people who spent four years earning a degree are finding it's not good for anything, and so forth. Well, there's a little data that I thought I would share with you uh, that comes from uh, a study of lifetime earnings. If students have less than a high school degree, their lifetime earnings are about $973,000 over their lifetime in 2009 dollars. If they have a bachelor's degree, that number rises to about $2.3 million. So over double the result with the degree. Uh, and if they have a professional degree, it goes to $3.6 million. So it is clearly the case that the value of an education is unambiguously significant and large. I think a second thing that I've noticed is that we often use this room in a setting a little bit like this, but with more seats out to the side, to welcome students as they start to study in the Zicklin School. So the room is full, 250 students or so. And 10 years ago, when I asked that group, do you think that this, your BBA from Baruch College, will be your last degree? 95% of the hands went up. They knew they were going to be finished as soon as they got that degree. Today, when I ask that group the same question, 5% of the hands go up. The notion that this is a knowledge economy, the notion that the master's degree of various types is now the coin of the realm and the thing that one needs to assure a really strong uh, career going forward is very much accepted by these students. They embrace it, they expect it, and they look forward to that as the next stage of their learning. And one of the things that that means for you all is that we will continue to produce a lot of very high-performing, ambitious people to join your firms and to help you move forward in your businesses. The last thing I want to share with you is a little information about what we've seen at Baruch. We, we worry about being able to provide not only access to New York City students, but also access to quality, to really extraordinary educational opportunity. So we worry about external signs that we're doing fairly well. And this summer has been a very good period for that. Uh, after graduation on June 1st, I went home and opened my email, and I saw the announcement of a study by the Educational Trust. The Educational Trust was interested in finding institutions in the United States that do a good job 
of educating low-income students. So they scoured 1,186 colleges and universities looking for schools that had a large percentage of Pell-eligible students, that's federal financial aid, and a high percentage of students graduating in six years. They found five institutions in the United States that met the standard they had set. I'm telling you this, of course, because we were one, and on the measures that they chose, number of students eligible for Pell, we were the highest of the five. In the terms of the graduation rate, we were also the highest of the five. Uh, secondly, we heard from um, Forbes magazine that they recently ranked business schools in the MBA programs on return on investment. After five years in the profession, what does their income look like as compared to the amount given up in foregone income and tuition? And uh, we were among um, the top institutions on that measure. Uh, Forbes magazine did that one. And the um, US News and World Report recently also surveyed uh, first year salaries relative to debt levels for students graduating from MBA programs. We were among the 10 MBAs with the most financial value at graduation. So just a little bragging to share with you this morning as you start your day. I look forward to hearing great things about the conference as I have heard in every year in the past. And let me bring Bob back to the podium to launch you off. Well, hello again, and thank you, John. Uh, I want to welcome you to another of our conferences. This is the 14th, uh, the Economic Function of a Stock Exchange. Today, uh, we have an excellent uh, array of speakers, uh, but excellence extends into the audience. We have a very distinguished audience here. I'm, I'm proud of it. Uh, the speakers, Bill Brodsky, will be following me. Um, Rado Franchoni will be following Bill, but not immediately. And the third uh, keynote will be Larry Leibowitz. Uh, and then we have our sponsors. And I want to call particular attention to our sponsors because uh, we owe, the, uh, owe you guys uh, a really big debt of gratitude. So let's, oh, we were a slide behind, John. That's who was talking before? Axe trading? I haven't seen any of the axe guys here yet. I think they're still out there chopping away. <laughs> Bids? Bloomberg trade book? Uh, Chicago Board of Options Exchange, Bill? Uh, Direct Edge? ISE? ITG? LiquidNet? NASDAQ OMX? NYSE Euronext? Pipeline Trading? The Tab Group, I haven't seen Larry yet, and Thomson Reuters, much appreciated. Now I want to say a word about the audience. Uh, John just mentioned part of it. The, uh, I am so pleased, uh, 29 different non-Peruk academicians here from 25 different academic institutions to, to build on that interface between, this is an academic institution. Uh, the conference has always been directed very much as a, a more an industry orientation than the pure academic orientation where you have one person get up, give a talk that the industry people and half the academicians don't understand. And it's followed by a discussant who gives comments that the only thing you understand about the comments is that he doesn't agree with the paper itself. So very different than our, than our approach here. But we have uh, uh, geographic diversification. We have a lot of people who came in from uh, uh, overseas. I'm looking at one from uh, Jersey from Italy. Uh, it's just come over for this. Rado himself came over for this. Hussein Erkin um, and Mustafa. For, and you guys are going to be in uh, South Africa next week. My God, I hope you don't get tired of airplane food. Stuff like that. Now, uh, this conference, oh yeah, from Ecuador. Well, 
I sh probably shouldn't have started it because we can, I, I, the organizer only gave me 15 minutes and already I'm running late. I have to talk to that guy. Um, I want to, I, I want to ask, there's a lot of interaction in the panels, it's not the presentation of speeches, it's, it's all discussion, interaction with the audience, and we produce a book on this, it'll be uh, me, of course, John Byrne, where are you, John? I know, would you stand up, John? I, I just, we, John has been working on the conference book with me and previously Tony Colonino for all these years. I don't know if you know what he looks like, uh, but a uh, huge debt of gratitude towards John. Uh, but when you guys speak from the audience, you see this sign? State your name and affiliation so that we know, because there are too many people uh, who get into the book and it says uh, unidentified speaker from the audience. We want to have your name. The um, uh, bios are in your package, so we won't get into bios. Now, I, I want to get right into my um, opening remarks that says on the program here. Um, the economic function of a stock exchange, do you, we all know what a stock exchange is, don't we? I guess we do. It's like we know what liquidity is. I guess we know. It's very difficult to define these things. And over the years, the def very definition of an exchange. So I, I got the bright idea of, I Googled it. So what is a stock exchange? Well, no, I, I couldn't really find it in Google. I went to my Webster's Dictionary. Uh, a stock exchange is a place where security trading is conducted, says Webster's Dictionary, on an organized system. Well, I guess I know what an organized system is. I think I work in the context of one, John. But... Uh, I, I, I Googled organized system. Can you imagine Googling organized system? And the main reference was to book binding. There are a couple of other things dealing with health and the like, but book binding. So I conclude that a stock exchange is a place where we bind the books. Sure beats cooking them. Well, I went on, uh, they also said it's an association of stockbrokers who meet and transact business on, uh, according to recognized forms and regulations, and I did not take the time to Google recognized forms and regulations. How do we proceed? Well, my approach to defining it is according to the economic function that a, an exchange produces, and that brings me to the title of the conference. Um, in a rapidly changing marketplace, that's the environment we're working within, living within, and wow, is it changing. What is the economic function? What can we point to? Now, in recognition of Baruch being an academic institution and that I give my students exams, I decided to present us with a multiple choice question. So, and this, this, this is what my exams look like. The students hate it. The economic function of a stock exchange is to handle transactions with reasonable speed at reasonable cost. Sounds good. Um, find the two sides of a trade, and we can call that quantity discovery. Produce the price, and we call that price discovery. Facilitate capital raising in the primary markets in our last panel today, we'll focus on that. And then this is, the, the fifth alternative is what drives my students crazy. All of the above. So what is the answer? Of course, all of the above. Now that brings me to my second question. What will I be focusing on? One, two, three, four. Which one? I bet you can guess. And if you don't, you have to take the course again. Produce the price. Price discovery. I, I have focused on that for a long time. Now,
turn my page to it soon. I, I like to call attention to the importance of price. The importance of price, not just to those who participate in a trade, but the importance of price to a much more diverse group of people. And that's why I emphasize, uh, or it's a big reason why I emphasize, price discovery. And here is some, uh, so some of the uses to which a discovered price is put. Uh, in terms of economics, we would call the production of price the production of a public good. It's a public good because it isn't just the people who are privately participating in the transaction. It is this broader group. You guys familiar with the term? Public good. And then the symbol of a public good is the lighthouse in the harbor. And Hussein you'll recognize, and, and Bill Brodsky, because I used this in a uh, World Federation of Exchanges talk uh, about two years ago. The, uh, the lighthouse in the harbor, any ship passing in the night can see it. And uh, it's, it's a public good. You can't tell a ship, well, you can't see the light uh, uh, because you didn't pay. You don't shut off the light, it is there, and, it's, 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 uh, and, and all the, the ships are, are the public. Uh, I like this image because the price that is discovered on an exchange is shedding light on the value of shares. It's the same, and you have other people who look at it. It's terribly important. So why hasn't it received more attention? Well, I've talked about it here, but in, uh, in the academic literature, it's a little hand-waving in the regulatory uh, discussions and documents and regs and, and questions. There's some discussion, but it's really, in my opinion, way underestimated, way underrepresented. And that's my other reason. Not only is it important, but people aren't paying enough time with it, and that's why I want to emphasize it in my presentation, my, 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 my talk today. How do we assess it? What do we use as a benchmark? Only a theoretician and God knows what the equilibrium price is. We can't see it, so it's difficult uh, to quantify deviations from the desired price that we're heading to. And then there's that tendency that if you can't quantify it, don't study it. And that's a very important thing from an academic perspective and from a regulatory perspective. But we can infer the accuracy of price discovery. It is possible. In work that I've been doing in the last couple of years, I've been following a path that shows that, that, that is all based on volatility. You can infer it from volatility. Uh, more specifically, intraday volatility. Even more specifically, opening 10 minutes or closing 10 minute volatility. Uh, volatility intraday is accentuated by spreads, by market impact, and by price discovery noise. And from what I've seen, the accentuation is too great to be explained by bid-ask bounce and market impact. A big, a big factor is price discovery noise, especially at market openings, finding the price, and also at market closings. Now, how can we assess intraday volatility? Well, one way is or volatility and draw inferences about price discovery is to look at the pattern of volatility uh, within the day. All my work is intraday. Uh, the pattern is well established to be U-shaped, but the U-shape is, is so severe that it's almost, if you just look at the opening minutes, it really shoots up, and in a second I'll show you um, that it's more staple-shaped than U-shaped. Another way is to look at the effect of a new market opening and closing procedure on, uh, on volatility. If a new procedure brings down volatility, then why? Is it, uh, how so? Maybe because it spreads, but we can account for that separately. And so I've been involved in NASDAQ, uh, presented us with a very nice controlled experiment when it introduced its opening and closing crosses, which they call them crosses, but they are price discovery uh, calls. So I call them a call option because it is price discovery. Uh, 
um, in uh, 2004. And I've been, under, I've been studying this for, oh God, it takes a long time to do these things in academia. We're still on it, but almost complete and almost ready to send the paper back for the uh, third round of review at one of the good journals. Uh, with Mike Pagano, who unfortunately can't be here today because he's teaching in, um, in Villanova, and Lynn Pang, who, if she isn't here right now, I don't see her, but it's because the train from New Jersey is a little bit late. Uh, so I want to just quickly show you uh, this slide. This is, this, is, this is intraday volatility. Those big dots that you see are the same as little dots, but I accentuated them so that you can pick them out for the opening minutes. And, and just look at uh, how inflated it is at the open and at the close. That's before the call, that's after the call, and that dashed line is only for a point of reference. Now this is, uh, visually I think a, a graph like this is helpful. Uh, you can see the significance of it, the magnitude of it uh, in, in the tables. It's very significant reductions. Now we had a study at Brett Redfern, is that you there? My God, my eyeglasses are working. This, this is stuff that we started after many years ago. Brett and I had lunch together, and uh, this is an outgrowth of, of that lunch, and I still, I still owe you a lunch because he paid for that one. There was an article in the, uh, in the New York Times on September 12th that called attention to the increasing uh, uh, volatility intraday. And because I'm, I'm I was going to read it, uh, but I, I want to keep reasonably on time. And I want to get to, there's a third way of looking at this that I'll call to your attention today. And that is, how has volatility changed over time? Well, what is the picture? And now this is going to be, uh, and I got to do this with lightning speed, uh, the first 10 minute volatility. Uh, measured day after day after day, starting at the beginning of 1993, going through um, uh, 2010. And if I make any mistakes here, uh, I have my co-author, my uh, doctoral student, Baruch professor, Scylla Allen, here, and I've done the work with Scylla, and I've also done the work with Jim somebody who a lot of you guys know, Jim Ross. But I don't think Jim is here quite yet. He will be joining us a little bit later. Now, before I show you this slide, why is price discovery so complicated? I'd like to give you an answer that, well, I'll see what your response is to it. Because stocks do not have fundamental values. God, we all talk about fundamental values. We all talk about prices decoupling with fundamental values. So how can I say that stocks don't have fundamental values? All right, I'll ask you a question. Do people agree in their stock analysis? Do they agree that XYZ stock is worth 3250? I mean, we teach dividend discount models and stuff like that. If you agree to the inputs in the model, you're going to and the model, you're going to get the same answer. But do we agree? Is the world, and I'll use one of our favorite academic terms, characterized by homogeneous expectations? I hear debate, discussion, disagreement. I see evidence of it all over the place. And if you and I disagree on the value, then wherein lies the fundamental value. The market is there to find us not a fundamental value, but an equilibrium value that harmonizes our desires, our expectations. Now I see Bill Freund sitting here, an old friend. And Bill, I want to remind everybody, but I'm not going to date it. Uh, Bill was uh, the chief economist at the New York Stock Exchange a good while back. He was subsequently a professor at Pace. And uh, 
Bill, you organized this seminar for a small number of academicians, and there weren't many of us in this area at the time. And uh, I, I don't think we either of us were fully grown at the point. Let's just leave the time dating at that. Uh, and Mel Batten was the CEO. M Mel joined us for a full day of discussion, and then we had other days of looking at facilities and the like. Full day of discussion. One of the points that came up in that uh, meeting was, what, what's the economic role of a stock exchange? That's where I got the title from. What's the economic function? And Mel was very good at listening. He didn't speak. I had my thoughts, because I was already involved in price discovery. But I wanted to hear if anybody else would say it. So I was listening. Mel was listening. The other academicians were talking about this, that, and the other thing. Nobody mentioned it. And then suddenly Mel raised his hand and he said, we produce the price. And I started applauding, yay, Mel. And Bill said, would you cool it, Bob? What are you doing? You're getting excited. But I have quoted that in a number of things that I've written. It has remained with me. I've discussed it with, with Bill. I think it's terribly important. Now, here is, there, there are a couple of ways of, of, of measuring volatility. There's, uh, uh, there's variance, high-low. This is high-low prices within the, within the range, within the 10 minutes. Uh, and uh, Scylla, Jim, and I have done it in, in multiple ways. This is a picture for the NYSE. And a picture, it's not coming down, it's going up. There's been a lot of, and you can adjust for underlying levels of volatility, say the VIX or longer period volatility. It has gone up, and this is in the opening. It, it's in harmony with the Times article, uh, the opening minutes of trading. This is the NYSE. This is NASDAQ. Uh, NASDAQ, it hasn't so... Depends how you look at it. If you tilt your head a little bit, it's gone up. Uh, you know, the, the results will be in our, in our tables and in our findings, but it's an interesting pattern. But when you bring the two together, look at how they've harmonized. My God, these two markets are looking much more similar. I find that very striking. <laughs> now, I have one last question, which, uh, the, Hey, you students of mine in the audience, this might be on the final exam. <laughs> How have the following affected the 10 minutes? Technology, fragmentation, spatial and temporal, new government regs, market structure change, change in longer run volatility. We've adjusted for that, so it's not that. Okay. What I'd like to do is invite you all back next year, and I'll give you the answer. <laughs> Boy, is that dirty pool. <laughs> well, from this, I want to move on, and it is a great pleasure to introduce somebody who I've known probably as long as anybody else in this room, and I've seen Bill and known of your reputation and seen what you've done with the uh, Chicago Board of Options Exchange, uh, Bill's role in the World Federation of Exchanges, he, he's chairman. It is uh, an honor and a real pleasure, Bill, for you to be joining us. And I just got to say that Bill's uh, travel is he, he's in Chicago to here, back to Chicago, and in Johannesburg by tomorrow morning. Well, it'll seem like that. Not exactly tomorrow morning, but in a couple of days. Welcome, Bill. Thanks, Bob. Uh, f first of all, uh, it's not Johannesburg tomorrow, but it is next week. Uh, but thank you uh, for inviting me uh, to this beautiful facility. And, and uh, I want to... Uh, make a couple of comments before I begin my talk. Uh, one is about Bernard Baruch. I don't know how many of you know about Bernard Baruch, but I grew up uh, with a father who went to this school, by the way, so it's special for me to be here. And he always used to talk about Bernard Baruch, and I decided it was time for me to read about Bernard Baruch. 
And I read about Bernard Baruch, and he was a great, uh, he was a poor, poor guy who came to New York and found his way into our markets. And it was the stock market, and it was the commodity markets. And I read about him. He became a very successful uh, investor. Some people called him a speculator, but actually he, he believed in fundamental investing. And I read something about one of his early successes. Today they'd call him a high-frequency trader. Do you know what he did? He was in New Jersey, on the Jersey Shore in 1898, and he found that there was going to be, he thought, a, a, a stock that was going to go up. But the stock exchange in New York was closed. It was, I don't know what that holiday it was, but there was a holiday. And he, here he is in the Jersey Shore. Remember, there were no telephones. And he wanted to get to his office in New York so he could send a cable to London. And the US markets were closed. And what did he do? He wanted to get a train. But the trains weren't running because of the holiday schedule. He literally commandeered a train, paid someone, and hired them to take him to New York on a train alone. I don't even know if it was legal. And he got to New York, and he got to his office on Wall Street, and he got a cable to London, and he bought the stock ahead of everybody else. Insider trading? Absolutely not. He just had a hunch that the market was going to open up higher on Tuesday morning or Monday morning, whatever the holiday was, and he was able in his early days to figure out how to invest in a particular stock before other people. I tell you this because this controversy today of high frequency trading, among other things, relates a lot to market structure. But it's no different than the pigeons during the Rothschilds, that there's always someone who's going to find a faster way to do it. And anyone who thinks that they're going to find ways to slow things down is really defying the natural proclivity of technology and people to try to be a little bit faster than someone else. And to try to say everyone's going to be at the same moment in time, I think, is unrealistic. So uh, Professor Schwartz, first of all, it's great to be here with you. And I want to acknowledge that when I was chairman of the WFE uh, over the 2009, 2010, we decided to have an award for lifetime achievement. And the first recipient of that award was you for your work in market structure and the tremendous work that you continue to do. And I applaud you for that. So when Bob asked me if I would come speak today, I said, well, what, what are you asking me for? I'm from the CBOE. We're an options exchange, and we do all, uh, uh, you know, some futures products, and we do option products, and you're talking about stock exchanges. What am I supposed to talk about? But I did start out my career on Wall Street in the stock brokerage business, and then I worked at the American Stock Exchange. So I said, you know, what I'd like to do, if it works for you, is talk about the role of futures and options markets in the evolution of stock exchanges. Because quite frankly, uh, when I grew up in New York, when Bill Freund was chief economist of the New York Stock Exchange, there were stock exchanges and there were commodity exchanges, and never the twain met. And over time, not only has that changed, but my thesis today is that the evolution of futures and options markets has forever changed the role of stock exchanges. And I'm going to go through some of the things that I think will explain that to you, because I know there are people in the room here who probably are not aware of some of the history. So I'm going to start with ancient history, and then I'll get to more modern times. <clears throat> so in ancient history, and I'm going back to the 1600s, there were stock exchanges in Amsterdam, London, Frankfurt, Paris. I won't go through all of them. And then there were commodity exchanges, and they were very separate in Amsterdam, in London, in Japan, in Osaka. There was a rice futures exchange. It was the very first futures exchange in the world. They didn't call it a futures exchange. And many were product specifics. In my research, I have found that there was a London coal exchange. There was a London corn exchange. In Chicago, we had the CBT, which did grains and only grains. COMEX only did metals. Remember COMEX? And then the CME at one time was the butter and egg, egg exchange, a produce exchange. So what happened? Well, from the 1600s, when they all started, or some, some of them started, in the 1700s, 1800s, it wasn't until 1972 when the concept of commodity exchanges started morphing away from commodities and into financial markets. Uh, the CME started the international monetary market to trade currency futures. 
the Board of Trade struggling with having only one product, basically, which was agricultural commodities, try to figure out how they could trade futures on stocks. But the SEC said no. No, no, you can't do that. Stocks are all world and you can't trade futures on stocks. So what did they do? They said, okay, we'll trade options on stocks. And there was an old put and call market in New York in those days. It was a very uh, uh, inside market, uh, not much price transparency. You used to have to look in the newspaper for ads on certain options. And it took the SE, uh, CFT, I'm sorry, it took the CBOE five years to get through the SEC pro process. Those of you who work with the SEC today can understand that that's not surprising. But it took five years to get the CBOE, which was the Board of Trades people, to get the CBOE concept approved. Um, and then, because the CME had started down the path of futures, uh, the CFTC was formed in 1974. So think about it, that the CBOE was formed before there even was a CFTC. But because CBOE's options were deemed securities by the SEC, uh, some of the smaller U.S. stock markets looked at that as a, a possible avenue of growth because at that time the New York Stock Exchange was the monolith. It was very hard for them to grow uh, their stock business. So they said, let's try this new thing called options. So over the next two or three, four years, the Amex, the Philadelphia, the Pacific, the Midwest Exchange, which is now the Chicago Stock Exchange, all began to trade options. And in Europe, the first exchange outside the U.S. to trade standardized options was called the European Option Exchange in Amsterdam, which was particularly interesting because Amsterdam is really where the first organized option markets had started in the 1600s and had fallen uh, away. And then in other marketplaces, there were exchanges created to trade either options on stocks or futures on financial products but never, or virtually never, at the stock exchange. So for example, in London it was Life, in Paris it was Matif, in Spain it was MEF, in Singapore it was Cymex, in Switzerland it was Sofex. Why weren't the stock exchanges creating these markets? And I think one of the reasons is that the stock exchanges viewed themselves as being something apart and different and even better than these secondary or tertiary markets called futures and options. Um, but what were the characteristics that allowed financial products to be traded on exchanges? I mean, we know that in the commodity markets it was simple. In fact, when I joined the CME years ago, they didn't call the products contracts as we do today. They called them cars. I said, what's a car? It's, it's a railroad car. You had a railroad car load. It was a car. And they said, how many cars are you trading? I said, what are you talking about? They were trading S&P futures. They called them cars. Didn't make any sense to me. The mentality was agricultural. But it was the agricultural structure of the futures markets that allowed for the creation of financial futures and options. So what were some of these characteristics? Well, the most basic were standardized contract terms. So, for example, May wheat, everyone understood May wheat. You delivered wheat in May. That was May wheat. But how about an IBM March 160 call? That was standardized. We didn't have 20 different brokers having IBM options expire on different days of a particular month. It was the same day in, in March, and it was a 160 strike price, and it was a call option. And that was the standardization concept. The second was next day settlement. Now, that might not seem so surprising today, but in those days, in 1972, stocks settled in five days. And in London, a fortnightly settlement. Think about that. And what facilitated next day settlement was certificateless trading because you needed five days to settle stocks because you had little old men running around with pieces of paper delivering stock certificates in 1972, 1973. And then the most important additional part which today they call the plumbing, is that there was a clearinghouse. The clearinghouse in, futures, in the futures world was very important because it intermediated the risk between the buyer and the seller. Because remember, in stocks, there's a buyer and there's a seller, and there's no risk. Once the, the stock is paid for, you take the stock, you put it in your vault, and forget about it. But in an option or future, it was an expiring product, and 
you needed to value it on a regular basis. So in clearinghouses in the futures world, what you had was the, the clearinghouse stood between the buyer and the seller, so you didn't have to worry about the obligation being fulfilled, and there was what was called daily mark-to-market. Remarkable how far-sighted that was then. If you think about Le Lehman and AIG, no one knew what the value was, and there was no third party to value the, to make, make, make a valuation. It was the firms making their own determination of what these things were worth. And in fact, in some cases, on highly volatile days, it wasn't just a daily mark-to-market, there were intraday margin calls. But again, stock markets didn't pay a lot of attention until the mid late 70s, the New York Stock Exchange said, you know, these guys out in Chicago, they're trading T-bonds, they're trading T-bills, futures, they're trading Ginnie Mae futures, they're trading options on IBM, that's our stock, on GE and, 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 and Coca-Cola. And so the New York Stock Exchange decided to, to create a futures exchange called NYFE, N-Y-F-E, New York Futures Exchange. But the New York Stock Exchange didn't have a core of market makers the way they did in Chicago because the specialist system by definition was a, a solitary franchise. What existed in Chicago markets were many market makers with no one having a priority over the other and it was easier to get a new product started because people could go from one product to another. You didn't have to have a franchise to trade an IBM option or to trade a Ginny Mae future. So this became Chicago style trading uh, pit trading without a central uh, specialist. Uh, the Amex, and I was at the Amex at the time, decided that if they wanted to get into options, they couldn't do it with a single specialist. So they actually tried to sell seats, and they did sell seats, but they weren't very successful because the New York community didn't understand this. They understood specialists. They didn't understand competing market makers. Um, and the other thing that I think was a deterrent to stock exchanges getting into the business besides their general inclination that we trade, we trade the real thing, we trade stocks. And these other things are kind of superficial or peripheral. But the other thing is that stock exchanges grew up historically where companies came to them and said, please, here's my company, I'd like to list the stock. And the stock exchange said, well, let me see if you meet our criteria. And by the way, we charge for this service. You gotta pay us to list your shares. At a futures and options market, People had to create, design a contract. And so these exchanges started hiring economists not to analyze markets, but to create new products. And that was a very different thing than what, what was common in stock exchanges back in those days. And there were also vast cultural differences. So for example, the SEC had existed for many years back in the 70s when the CFTC was brand new. So you had in different jurisdictions, the US in particular, Japan, in the US you had the SEC and the CFTC. Very different philosophical approaches to regulation. In Japan it was the MAF versus the MITI. Uh, and same thing in Australia and in Taiwan. Different regulatory structures for these different markets even though the underlyings were very often equity products or government bonds. Uh, and in other countries, and Germany is my best example, uh, trading futures contracts were illegal. So there were markets in the world that wanted to trade these new, new products, couldn't because there were sometimes 200-year-old rules that didn't, didn't allow it. And in the United States, the concept of cash settlement was a new one. Australia actually was the first country that allowed cash settlement as a way of having these products traded. In the US, it took the Shad Johnson accord to allow for cash settlement, which then allowed, where's Bob Chicago, for the trading of stock index futures. Without that legislative change, it couldn't have happened. And then we had, of course, dramatic changes in the structure and governance of exchanges. And now I'm bringing us to a much more recent period. So exchanges, be they stock exchanges or futures or options markets, particularly in this country, were really not-for-profit member organizations where they were run very often by the members and very often for the members. Uh, there were changes that were brought about by the federal government more on the security side uh, under the 75 Act amendments, but the reality is the value of exchanges was in the memberships, not in the ability of the exchanges to operate as for-profit institutions. And in fact, uh, the seat 
was really the value. And if you think back even 10 years ago, before the exchanges demutualized, the value of the membership or the involvement in exchange was in the seat, not in the enterprise value of the exchange. Uh, now, what about products? What was the, where, where, where were the products created and how did that evolve? And, and my, again, thesis is that most of the innovation in these financial derivative markets took place between 72 and 82 in Chicago. Uh, foreign exchange, which had been tried a little bit in New York, uh, became much more successful at the CME and their IMM division. Interest rates, uh, first Ginny Mays, then T-bonds, T-bills, and when cash settlement came about, euro dollars. And then, of course, stock indexes, uh, which actually started initially in Kansas City with the value line index in New York with the NYSE composite index, but the CME became the most successful, uh, probably because it was the best index, which is the S&P 500, which really represented the benchmark of the U.S. stock market. And for options, one of the things that I found the most interesting when I studied the history of the CBOE is they knew they wanted to trade options on stocks because they weren't allowed to trade futures on stocks, but it took them a while to figure out what it was they were going to trade. And all of a sudden, the light bulb went off, and they said, we're going to trade the premium because they weren't sure exactly how to trade an option on a stock. You know, it was a call, but what are you trading? And it was finally they came to the understanding or conclusion that the, what you're really trading is the premium of the option, the call option or the put option. Now, the interesting thing that happened with options at the CBOE in 1973 is within just two years, the Black-Scholes model came out. Remember, the, the, the Nobel Prize didn't happen until 1997, but Black-Scholes came together with uh, Robert Merton to come out with a theory on pricing of options which had no relation to the CBOE. It was related to how corporations would value options they granted to their executives. But the combination of the creation of the CBOE, the, the, the publication in the financial journals of the Black-Scholes model, and the Texas Instrument handheld calculator allowed for rapid pricing or valuation of options in the very early days. Because otherwise, people didn't know what, what IBM stock would, trade, would, would change price hundreds of times during a day. How did that affect the price of an IBM May uh, 160 call? It was changing all the time, but the calculator allowed the early market makers to do it. And then index options and index futures came about. Very exciting changes. The other thing that very, was very important is as CBOE became more established, the Amex wanted to get into the business, and the SEC said, well, we don't want to have all these separate clearinghouses because they had just been through the paperwork crunch of the 70s. It was a disaster. And so the Option Clearing Corporation came about, which was jointly owned by the options exchanges. So we had for the first time, and still a pretty unique model in the world, what we call fungibility. And that is an option bought on one exchange could be sold on another. And so that was another aspect of the development of the business, which is still pretty unique, particularly if you look at other countries. So what was the reason, how, why was this successful? What were the ingredients that made these markets successful? And remember, during all this period, these exchanges were still very separate from stock exchanges. Stock exchanges kept doing their thing, listing the companies, and very little by little automating some of their systems. But what was unique about these derivative markets, particularly in the US, and some, some of these things were then uh, uh, exported elsewhere, was what I call the culture of risk taking. And a lot of it was both here in New York and in Chicago, and that was that there were traders on floors that didn't have any special franchise, but they learned how to hedge positions. They would buy one uh, option, they'd sell another. So they were hedging themselves off. They would buy a stock, they'd sell a call. They were doing different things, where again, the, 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 the history or the development in the, in the stock exchanges was the specialist was the center, and you either were long or you're short. There was nothing in between. And, 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 and even as the option markets developed, the specialist community in New York did not embrace it for, by saying, gee, we have this big long position, how do we hedge it over the weekend? It seemed obvious to those of us who understood it, but it wasn't being practiced. And then we saw from the trading floors, firms develop 
by some of the bright people on the floors who left the floors. And the three firms that came to mind as I prepared this were O'Connor & Associates, right out of the CBOE floor. Uh, CRT, which was called Chicago Research and Trading. O'Connor ultimately purchased by Swiss Bank Corp, CRT by Nations Bank, and then Hull Trading. Uh, Blair Hull figured out how to automate some of these things, and right before his uh, um, IPO that he was planning, he went to um, and sold the company to Goldman. So then we had internationalization, and within a few short years, there were 50 exchanges around the world that traded futures and options, again, in most cases, not associated with stock exchanges. And it, the, the growth was tremendous, uh, and uh, it, 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 it continued. And what really changed over the last few years is that as companies and exchanges started to go public, they realized that there was much more synergies. And so certain countries, uh, the ex stock exchanges and the futures and options exchanges came together. And I could go through the list, but Bob is giving me a warning that I got to move along, so I'm going to move along a little more quickly. But I think the most important changes in the last 10 years was demutualization, where exchanges went from the value being in the seats to the value being in the exchange itself and how companies went public, which changed the governance, made them much more competitive, and automation. And these things didn't happen. Uh, it, was, it was more coincidence, but it was automation and demutualization that has allowed for a lot of the dramatic changes and the coming together of the options and the stock exchanges. So one of my theses is, today is that even though the stock exchanges resisted in many ways the evolution of options in stock markets, once they started bringing them together and once demutualization occurred, it became very evident that the option markets and the futures markets were growing faster than the stock markets and they were more profitable. So even though you can study stock exchanges today, Professor, my belief is that the engine of growth in many of these exchanges, which are still considered stock exchanges, are really coming from these derivative markets. So I want to just show you a couple of slides of where we are today. And if I could do that, I'll do it quickly. You'll see the dramatic growth, if you don't mind putting that up. Here. OK, so how futures and options exchanges change the world of stock exchanges. Sorry about that. OK. So this is from WFE data, and if anyone wants to drill down more, this is 2010 data of WFE. It's about a 40-page slide deck. I've taken three slides to show you. So first, global derivative markets have had 26% growth rate in 2010, with 11 billion futures and 11 billion options traded. Asia has now surpassed Europe and the Americas in total volume. Stunning numbers. Now here's by product group. Equity derivatives represent the largest category in terms of contracts traded, but represent a small percentage of the notional value. I think what's important is uh, interest rates by definition have larger notional value. I think volume is probably a more telling number. Uh, but let me just give you a couple of highlights of where the, the volumes are. Uh, the most active index options in the world are Korea, the National Stock Exchange of India, and it's CBOE. Index futures, it's CME, Eurex, Russia, India, and Osaka. And ETF options, totally dominated by the US. A little bit in Canada and a little bit in Brazil, but ETF options are a very fast growing area. Then we have interest rates, dominated by CME, LIFE, and Brazil. And then FX, uh, Russia, India, uh, CME, and Brazil. And then commodities, what's most significant, I think, is that the top five exchanges, top four exchanges, three are Chinese. So China is going to be a tremendous growth area of these derivative markets. And the last uh, is what, under the category of the WEV statistics, is exotic. And I'm happy to say that we are the center of that, and that is that we created a way to take Bob's statistics and trade volatility. So we've discovered the price of the volatility of markets by using options that we trade to create a volatility number from which we then trade futures on volatility and options on volatility, and that's VIX. 
and CBOE dominates it. The second largest is Eurex. So the, the, the bottom line is that uh, there's tremendous growth in these markets. Uh, if I had more time, I would tell you that there are studies out there. I'll just mention them instead of getting into them in detail. All in the last 12 to 14 months on the growth potential of the option markets. One is on institutional investors by the Tower Group. The other is by uh, the Bellamy Research. Independent financial advisors are continuing to use options more and more. And last, it just came out uh, this month by TAB on the demand by Europeans to trade U.S. options. And I think what's significant about this is that we have, as derivative markets, now have enough history that very important groups of people, institutional investors, independent financial advisors, and um, European investors are going to be using these markets, particularly U.S. markets, but not, not only U.S. markets, to add to their ability to trade and invest in stocks. So uh, I, I'm going to just wrap up by saying that it's been a remarkable uh, 35 years of growth of these markets, and what were viewed in the past as something very separate from stock exchanges are now, with almost no exception, integral to the growth, the prosperity, and the financial well-being of stock exchanges. So I guess what I would say is that we maybe are now mainstream. Thank you very much.